Hi, my name is Caroline Gabriel. I'm the research director at Rethink Technology Research. And today I was talking about low power wide area networks and the standards landscape. Thank you, everybody. Uh, at Rethink Technology Research, we've traditionally um, focused on operators, their networks and their business models, particularly mobile operators. Um, a couple of years ago, we actually set up a specialised practice in Internet of Things. And given our heritage and our research base, um, we've concentrated mainly on the wide area aspect of that, as Graham said, applications like smart cities rather than the, um, the, the short range technologies. Although, of course, both those sectors have sort of similar challenges in terms of the sheer variety of, uh, of potential standards that there are. So in um, low power wide area, we've seen quite a number of, uh, of technologies emerging, a lot of them around quite specific use cases. And I'm going to just set the scene for three gentlemen who will give some more specific um, perspectives on, on individual technology approaches. I just really want to give a map of what's emerging, how complicated it is, what are some of the choices that are going to face the industry. Really quite soon, um, I think one of the things that's interesting when I, look, when I compare this market to when I was covering, say, the emergence of 3G or even 4G, is how this, for once, is not a technology that's going around looking for an application. There are a lot of organisations out there that urgently do need these kind of networks and they haven't yet found quite the right solution um, to their issues. So, so timing is of the essence, which I think is probably a remarkably good thing for the wireless industry compared to some of our, our past experiences. So low power wide area networks, um, I guess if we're taking a broad definition, you could say that GSM is the most um, established and successful of those, and it powers most wide area M2M connections today, and, and I suspect will continue to do so for some years. Um, however, it's not quite low power enough, um, or even in some cases low cost enough in terms of the end module for, uh, for some of the emerging applications uh, in smart cities in particular. Although I think we should not get too hung up on smart cities. Um, later on, I want to touch on some of the other industries and organisations which may have an even more urgent requirement um, for, for these kind of networks. But there are urgent use cases um, arising, and a lot of the ones we hear about are things like smart traffic management, which can have a, a massive impact on uh, social and economic success of a city. There's a lot of funding and government interest around the world in smart cities, and I think this is partly why it's always in the centre of this debate. Um, but as I say, we look at the retail sector, look at the manufacturing sector. There are applications there which could use these kind of technologies and generate 100 times more value, um, arguably, than a city. So it's a very, very big uh, potential opportunity. And there's a window of opportunity for the specialised network that, um, that have emerged around these use cases and to fulfil um, this, as I say, fairly urgent demand um, for very low power, um, long range, very low cost um, networks. And the window is there because, as I say, GSM isn't quite living up to uh, all the requirements anymore. 3GPP, as uh, we'll have heard earlier in the day and we'll, we'll hear more about, um, is working on variants of LTE, streams of LTE that are optimised for these applications, but they're a couple of years off full commercial availability. IEEE is working on uh, a sort of Wi-Fi implementation targeting similar use cases, um, 11AH. Again, that's, that's some way off, that's in a similar time scale. So in the meantime, if you urgently need one of these networks and GSM isn't going to do it for you, uh, or you don't have access to licensed spectrum, uh, then we are seeing um, a whole range of, uh, of choices. Some of them have the heritage in private networks, and I think it's important to remember that private networks have always been important in M2M, and I suspect are going to remain so for certain um, opt optimised applications. So some technologies that don't become sort of big global standards may, may still have a very important niche. But the picture we have at the minute is fragmentation with, um, among as I say, many choices, and, and we'll hear about, about one of them from the panel. Um, two have got market momentum at the minute in terms of some quite big partnerships and deployments and, and a lot of, uh, of PR profile, and that's LoRa and Sigfox. So I will dwell briefly on each of those. 
I think the important thing is that each of these networks has really very different approaches architecturally and in many cases very different business models, but they're all trying to achieve the same thing. Very low power, very low cost, similar types of, of applications. Um, so increasingly the functionality is looking quite similar. Let's use France as an example because it's got, uh, Sigfox is French um, and Laura has quite uh, major strategic partnerships with two of the four big mobile operators over there. Um, I think this just highlights that you can have two technologies targeting uh, roughly the same space, um, but with very different approaches. So Sigfox has tended to be much more focused on infrastructure partnerships. Um, TDF is a TV mast company in France. There's Arkiva in the UK, there's Cellnex in Spain, those are all partners um, which are deploying Sigfox networks. Um, Laura has tended to be uh, more engaged with the mobile operators and providing them with a network, um, particularly as they try and sort of bridge that gap between GSM and future LTE. Um, so you can see that uh, Laura can, um, can happily work with two of the mobile operators, Bouygues and Orange, and Orange uh, is working with multiple M2M technologies. Um, GSM, it's, tr it's a very early trialist of narrowband LTE technologies, uh, and it's deploying quite a major LoRa network. So this is nothing here is simple. It's not a question of one company pick, betting on one option. It's very much a mix and match scenario. And in some cases, it'll be choosing the right technology for a particular use case. Um, in a sense, that's a luxury that operators or vertical markets or enterprises can say, well, which network best suits my particular application. But of course, while that can be a positive, it can also um, just perpetuate the fragmentation. So there's a dilemma there. It's not a new dilemma. Um, we've d debated for decades whether um, networks like emergency services or transport are best to have their own completely optimized critical network or whether they need the economies of scale of cellular. That debate will never be resolved because there are, you know, there are merits to, to both sides of the argument. And um, that's, uh, I think we'll see that argument in the Internet of Things extend to all kinds of sectors and, and applications with the potential for even more fragmentation. So some very quick comments on uh, these two uh, technologies which really have acquired a certain amount of, of scale and profile. Sigfox has got deployments in 12 countries when I last looked. It might have gone up um, because it seems to announce one about every week. It's, uh, it is extremely uh, low bit rate, um, so it's going for applications that uh, are, are using very, very tiny amounts of data and usually quite infrequent uh, message updates or status updates. Um, therefore, it can operate with extremely um, low cost of equipment and extremely low power. So that's suited to some applications and not others. Um, it's extended its reach because it's, uh, it's included bidirectional support now, which it used not to have, or only in a very limited way. Um, but still, um, Sigfox is, is a network that, uh, as, as it would say itself, is confined to certain applications that uh, really do require the lowest possible power and the lowest possible uh, data rates. There are plenty of those applications. Um, anything that involves uh, a device that just needs to send a little message every so often saying, I'm here, which might be a meter or a home, a home gateway or a security alarm, which is one of their... Uh, their commercial deployments is a national backup network in Spain for all the security alarms on houses, which is a classic um, Sigfox application, I would say. They're a company that wants to move away from real hardware to build an ecosystem of hardware partners and adopt um, a licensing and a managed service model. So most of their revenue is coming from actually managing a service on a network that's been rolled out by partners um, and, and charging on, their, I think there are various levels of charging for that, and also for licensing the technology, of course. One thing that's very clear about most of these um, LPWA technologies is that the business models are, are fairly diverse at the minute, and there's an element of experimenting with several to see which one works, but, so we'll, we'll see. But um, you can see on the right, uh, Sigfox's uh, sort of basic architecture. We've all the uh, processing, the APIs and so on, sitting in the Sigfox cloud. 
I mentioned some of its key partnerships, many of which are with infrastructure companies such as Arkiva. And as such, it's become um, a potential competitive weapon for companies which want to provide an alternative to uh, the established operators um, by building um, alternative parallel networks. LoRa, by comparison, um, its most strategic partnerships are with the mobile operators themselves. So it's almost it's providing a tool for them to be able to deploy while, well, either while they wait for LTE or potentially if they find it's good enough instead of LTE for certain use cases. And of course, that will that decision will vary from operator to operator. Um, but. LoRa, to some extent, is, is the opposite of Sigfox. Um, I'm not sure, when you speak to either of these organisations, it's not clear that it was a strategic decision to go in these routes. It's more they've taken the market opportunities that have come their way, which you have to do if you're an opportunistic technology of these kinds. Um, but, but they both, uh, by hook or crook, they have uh, achieved quite a lot of success. Um, LoRa is interesting in that there's the upper layer, it's called LoRaWAN, um, so all the software and APIs and so on can be decoupled completely from the LoRa physical technology. Um, that physical technology was designed by Semtech and they remain the, the major source of chips. But there again, uh, being a minor technology is all about having your options open. And I think members of the LoRa Alliance, which is the group that supports this technology, you know, very open that they'll they'll go in multiple directions to make sure that their technology works. So, in theory, in future, um, a different physical layer could be substituted in, or even um, there are a couple of companies that are even building their own platform as a service uh, cloud at the back. So it's it's very mix and match this one. But um, some big mobile operators, as well as the French ones, as uh, companies like Swisscom and KPN, that are deploying quite significant. Uh, networks based around the LoRa technology. So the outcome is an extremely varied um, access network picture, and there are lots of others that I haven't mentioned. Um, there's, uh, well, we're going to hear from N-Wave um, shortly, but there are, there are quite a few other low-power wide area networks. Um, there's Telenza. Some of them are, are very geared to just one or two use cases, and some are trying to get out and <laughs> have a very broad reach. The ones that want to uh, have a very wide reach are um, more or less forced to work in unlicensed spectrum. And that tends to be the 868 megahertz band in Europe, 900 in the US, which has its own uh, challenges, particularly for something like Sigfox, which doesn't, um, doesn't fit all the contention-based rules that those spectrums tend to have. So that in itself um, is interesting. However, as we say, the variety of use cases will require a variety of access types of network and a variety of spectrum bands. And at the moment, if you want to go a long way um, with your cell, uh, these are the, the sub-gig bands are undoubtedly the best ones, and these are the most widely used. So if harmonization comes, in our view, it will take many years, and it probably won't happen. Um, as with my starting point, I think there'll be a role for optimised private networks, particularly in, in some critical communications areas. Um, different parts of the world have very different approaches to whether they want a single network or not. Um, the, the balance between uh, optimization and the economies of scale of having just one network is a delicate one when it comes to lots of these vertical use cases. Um, and and just, the, just the timing, as we said. Um, LTE, I think it would be fair to say, is likely to get a big slice of the wireless pie, but it does run in licensed spectrum, at least for now. Um, so I think what's important and what we're increasingly hearing from the whole ecosystem, and particularly the vertical markets who will drive most of this, um, is that to accelerate, uh, sorry, to accelerate um, really usable systems that deliver value, we stop just talking about which is the access network and look up the network stack look at the APIs, the security, um, the, uh, the actual service delivery. All these are where a lot of the um, IoT value will be delivered. If you start talking to Amazon or GE, if it's Industrial Internet Initiative, these are companies that will use low-power wide area networks at massive scale, um, beyond what, what we're talking about at the minute when we, when we speak about smart cities. 
but they won't do it until they see interoperability at every level of the stack, not just down at the access. So I think there's, um, there's a big challenge for the wireless industry to start um, thinking in, in a bigger way, as they've done in cellular, uh, but it needs to be done uh, in, in some of these more specialised areas as well. Uh, McKinsey did a study recently where they said that 40% of the potential value of the IoT comes from inter is lost if interoperability doesn't exist at every level up to APIs. Um, that's a lot, and they were talking about many, many trillions of, of dollars of potential being left on the table. Cisco made a similar study which said 40%-ish as well. So uh, let's not get hung up entirely on the religious debate around which is a good access network. Because the next step is going to be 5G, which is going to be, as we all know, heavily driven by the IoT. Um, on the way to there, we may well get a 5G architecture that accommodates all kinds of access networks and doesn't make, um, make people make hard and fast choices. So, as we said, the low-power wide area networks, they live in unlicensed spectrum. They may get licensed spectrum options. Some of them are submitting to Etsy and 3GPP to see if some of their technologies will be kind of incorporated into future releases, um, and particularly the 5G uh, releases. We saw Huawei buying Newell, which is a low-power wide area um, pioneer, and adopting some of those technologies into their cellular platforms. So there will be a shakeout, but that doesn't mean that we have to have one, uh, one victor, I don't believe, and I think perhaps it would be short-sighted to get too hung up on, on that outcome. And with that, I shall hand over to some of the people who may argue against that motion. 